nice, like like a living room. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very nice idea. Love you guys. Hey, this is on the internet. If you guys just walk here and then wave, maybe your parents. Maybe your parents. <laughs> Oh, she's sick? Oh, okay. What a good, so say hello to Hannah. Thank you for bringing her friends and I. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, right. Look at the fellow Finn. He said the Finns don't like to talk. I don't know. So I gotta check with. <laughs> With him, if that's true or not. Because he's the thing in your family. I know, right? It feels like that. Take care. Love you. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a family. Okay, you want to start? Yeah, you start. What do you have in mind? Um. Okay, we could uh, we could interview Pastor Monty. Uh, maybe the opening question would be: um, When did you first start to hear the voice of God? When in your Christian life? When did you start hearing the voice of God? Do you hear the voice like on the outside of your ear? You know, a sound through the sound waves? I'm sure God could use sound waves, but then go past your ear to your, your brain, and you hear. Do you really hear? And how often do you hear, right? Hi, Claudia. Hey, good to see you. Uh, so, and when did that start? And then, then is there a way in the, in the Christian life where we actually avail ourselves to hearing from God? Isn't that a good question? Like we avail ourselves, we put ourselves in a position where we actually could hear from God. So this is a very good subject. I enjoyed it very much so i'm just going to say a couple of things and you know like provoke pastor mati to say a lot about it so so you feel free pastor yeah i i think that uh one thing that i'd like to mention is that that being a young believer uh when i came to our ministry there was a turning point there when I understood that God actually spoke in those meetings. Because I had been to a lot of meetings and, and um, I had not really um, experienced that, that, that I'm in the meeting and in every meeting 
God would speak to me. It was amazing to me. And then I, I remember I, my working hours were that way that I was a little bit late always from the meeting. So I remember running to those meetings. I remember like, you know, getting off the bus and running so that you would not miss it. And, and, and being young and being like excited and, and single-eyed about this whole thing. Uh, I remember like talking with one another. We were talking after the meeting about the message, which was also a new thing for me as a believer, because I had not experienced that before, that the congregation, the people who were there, would be talking about the message afterwards. Meaning, because something meaningful was said there, and 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 we were brought up that way. Then, under your leadership, that 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 we gave our attention to the message, and like like in an Orthodox church. I don't come from an Orthodox background, but but in the Orthodox church, like the the idea is, it's like a divine play, and that kind of holistic experience of the whole you know, the service is that way. But in our ministry, it always has been the word. Like, it's all around the word. It's not the music. It's, I mean, we love the music. It's not around, you know, this kind of like, you know, philosophical conversations or apologetics or any of that. But it's the word and the, and the, and the preaching of the word. And when I said in the beginning tonight in the service that, that it, what makes this so easy is that God is here, really. If God wasn't here, this would be horrible. I mean, not horrible, but maybe horrible too, but, but it would be like impossible for us to manage. I mean, everybody's life, everybody's opinions, everybody's like communications, misunderstandings, you name it, it's endless. That, that trying to fix the flesh is endless. And sometimes churches fall into that, that it's just trying to control and, 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 and like fix the flesh. And there is no joy, there is no freedom, there is no uh, spiritual satisfaction because there is no spiritual orientation. But another thing that I just wanted to add, just because this is on this theme, is that 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 one thing was that that you would always expect and and you knew that you would hear something and then that this understanding of having a pastor teacher i know there are like all kinds of opinions about it and and maybe we have been accused that that you know not on biblical foundation because it's very biblical concept but but because of denominational you know different interpretations of that that there should not be one pastor teacher and so on but my testimony is that when i have a pastor teacher God uses him in a special way in my life. God speaks through him to me. I mean, I listen to other preachers in the church, other elders and so on, but God speaks through that pastor teacher. And it's so, it's so supernatural without making it strange or weird, but it is so supernatural. And so many times I have come to the service, I have come to the conference, and my pastor is speaking and that's where the definition comes. And again, not to diminish, you know, the other men's portions and, 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 and the way how God speaks through everybody who is a born-again believer, or more or less. But, but the role of, a, of a, your pastor teacher in this matter is that, that God speaks specifically. And, and like we have, we have a situation in always continuing situation in churches that we have to choose a new pastor and there is a question who would be the right kind of a pastor who would have the right kind of personality and so on we were speaking with pastor Schaller about it in general a couple of days ago and i just understood that that those are even secondary issues the main issue is 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 like is the message anointed like, is, is that man anointed by God to bring the message? Because if that is so, then it's easy. 
But if it is like, you know, we're going to try to fix the right kind of a person there, the mess is going to just be endless. <laughs> it's just going to continue like that on a, on a natural level. So I, I strongly believe in the supernatural nature of the of the ministry of the word and and in the congregation how it I can testify about that in my personal life. Um, maybe for m most of us here, maybe there are some new people, but m mostly it goes that what, what Pastor Monty is saying and what we read in the Bible is that the Bible is taught there are gifted men in Ephesians 4 that have the ministry of the word, 1 Corinthians 14, prophesying or preaching edifies the church. Where we hear um, from the Spirit what the, what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us in teaching, and there are many expressions in the Bible. For example, um, what is a proverb? What is a proverb? Is a proverb a doctrine? No, a proverb is uh, wisdom by observation. So you have proverbs where a wise man looks at something in life, he observes something, and then he writes down the proverb. So in the church, I hear proverbs. I should learn proverbs. And in my Bible study, I'm reading proverbs. And then what is a psalm? What is a history? What is a doctrine? What is a revelation about the future? We heard from the book of Revelation tonight. I liked it that the voice spoke like a trumpet. Wasn't that good? That boy, I heard a voice like a trumpet. How many love trumpets? I love the sound of a trumpet, you know. You know, man, I wonder what that voice was like. It just, it stirs me up. Okay, so, if you want to hear the voice of God, then really it's going to come from the Bible because that's the word of God. And here's a good question for you. The Bible will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. Will God be talking in heaven? Right? God will be talking in heaven, right? Because the word will never pass away. And because that's the nature of God. But will he ever say anything that is essentially outside of the Bible? I don't believe so. I believe everything that he would be saying would be coming from the Bible. Because that's his word. That's his word. His whole mind. Now, there are layers in the Bible. I believe there are layers where you find depth and depth and depth. And some of us have been reading it for 50 years. And we can't come to the bottom of it. And you never will. Forever and ever. Isn't that amazing? So where do I start to hear from God? It's in the church. God has ordained that he would speak to us in the church. From where? From the Bible. How? By his spirit and ordained uh, pastor who is the teacher of the Bible or the preacher of the Bible. Uh, if I don't have this as my starting point, I, I know that I, I didn't have that as my starting point. I was independent. I became a believer. Um, I could read the Bible on my own. Um, I was, um, you know, like just trying to find my way. But when I came into, and in my case, it was this church, where I started to listen, and then the same thing happened to me that happened to him, which was there was a time in the message where it was like, you know, it's like, oh, wow. You know, then the second thing he said, which is very good, is after the message, it really, in a way, wasn't done. It wasn't over. It was more like, did you hear that? You know, yeah. I want to talk about it. You know. Um, 
I want to carry it home with me. And I believe after the message tonight, people are driving home, and I believe they're carrying that thought in their hearts, you know, that Jesus speaks like even one word. And, um, and we heard, and that's so edifying. So uh, rap sessions happened, and then you find some people in the church that are very much into it, and you find you're reading. You want to read other men and women of God that have written things that they have heard from God. Because I'm a firm believer in being edified personally, and I have conversations, but I also want to hear what other men and women have heard from God in history and read those things that are very edifying. Whatever is pure, whatever is good, virtuous, whatever is of good report, you think on these things. So I'm a, I'm a reader. I may, maybe I could ask Pastor Monty. I'm not really a reader, but I, I'm looking for those words. I'm not, it's not like I'm reading thousands and thousands of words every day. It's more like I'm looking for those words that speak, you know, that idea. So, um, um, did you did you follow? I forgot what I was going to ask yeah, you. You, you asked about the reading, yeah. Yeah, I I think that I. A quiet time in reading. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, like. Um, <laughs> We all Google, right? Because it's an amazing resource. I mean, whatever you face, you know, question. In the past, you would ask grandfather or grandmother or, you know, uh, dad or mom, they knew, or a teacher, but nobody needs that anymore. You just Google it directly and, and you learn to trust Google and that's dangerous. And for a pastor, I don't recommend you to Google your messages. I don't uh, think that well-Googled messages are good. I think you have to be very careful with that because there's a lot of stuff there. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, we all have looked for resources and and I once I this is what kind of opened my eyes that that I was like you know preparing a certain theme and there was like an amazing like you know points and I was like writing and and then I understood that it's a Mormon site and then I said, said to myself that's it no no preparation not googling in preparation because, I mean, I really, and maybe I'm the old school, maybe I'm old-fashioned in this, but I really believe in preparation, in prayer and meditation and, and, and being just with the Bible, not with a lot of books prepare, pre- preparation. I, I believe in preparation. And, and maybe it is, for me, it works that way. I read, I read... A lot, and I write a lot, but but I'm interested more in like hearing from God through the Bible. I know there are a lot of good books, and they would probably fix me and help me <laughs> to be more normal in many ways. Uh, but but I I enjoy the fact that you you hear from God through the Bible, and that's how you can like you know receive things that you would not be able to get from Google. Google is not spiritual. Whoever he is. (laughs) Yes, I I think uh, information is like a big city. Let's say New York City. If you call New York City a big, you know, it's a big city, and information is like a big city. And when you go into the big city like New York, you can get in trouble. 
But but if you have to, if you, maybe you need to go to New York. But when you go to New York, you need to know what to stay away from. You need to know like where you are going and what you're looking for. And I think of like the internet like that. Like it's a great it's a great resource, but you have to be wise. And it's like with all information. Also, by the way, you might say, I'll protect myself by not having any information. But that's wrong. Because Jesus said, you know, obviously, Jesus told us that the best thing we can do, the only thing we do is to honor the, the Father. And he said in John 7, 17, he said, you will know the truth. Yeah, how does it go? If you, if you do what I say, you will know that you know that the doctrine is not of me, but it's coming from my Father. And also the great, the great blessing of, um, of um, having a reduced life, a simple life, of finding the most important things, the profound things. And I think that's what we carry away from your message, which is, I like that part, like there's so much talking in the world of the first Adam. He talks so much, like, the first sentence after the sin happened was like a long, you know, a long, complicated story, you know. Adam, you know, have you eaten of the tree that I, you know, I was afraid in the woman that you gave me. And, you know, so, uh, you know, that's a very good point. And, and I think um, when, when the Holy Spirit reduces our life, and we find the profound words of life, holding forth the words of life. Now, here's a, another a Bible study, if you want to do one, is study First and Second Timothy and find out and count the number of times he says these phrases, like vain jangling, like babblings, you know, words of no profit. You, you count, and he told Timothy, stay away from words that are not godly, edifying, is another phrase. Words of no profit, vain jangling, a lot of distraction. And that's why many of us are not on social media. Many of us are not involved in all of the chatter that is happening, because it's foolish. It's just foolish, and if you compare Wisdom with foolishness, wisdom far exceeds foolishness. The way is above to escape from hell below, Proverbs 15, 26, or somewhere there. So uh, I think, you know, did you want to say more? Yeah, just, um... Also this principle that, that, that there are times when you just have to let things go like you cannot like yeah. i'm sure you have been in a situation when you for example apologize to someone or forgive someone and and then they like you know they tell you that it's not enough or you have to like you know continue talking about it and they want to talk and talk and talk and where are we going with this talking to we are going to find out that you actually are really guilty and more guilty than you understood that you are or something. And it's, it's just not a good, good way to do it. Yes, there are issues that need to be discussed, maybe even professionally sometimes in cases of abuse and this kind of like serious issues. But, but let's not bring that to the church activity as such that, that it is like, you know, taking our all our <laughs> all our like you know time and energy and 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 trying to like you know talk and talk and talk and talk when life is actually going on life is moving on and opportunities and god is paul says you know forgetting those things which are behind forgetting those things which are behind. let go and move on and 
And the same way, like maybe even in in like great victories also, we cannot like today live in old victories and like talk about something. Sometimes it happens with churches, for example, in their understanding of missions, like they are a greater grace church. And they are like, you know, saying that we in greater grace, we believe in missions. But for 30 years, they have not sent out one missionary. But they are talking about as if, because 30 years ago, there was a missionary that was sent out from there. Was like, you know, uh, let's move on. Let's move on because life is like getting more interesting. You are missing it because you want to park there at that garbage can and, you know, just stay there and you don't want to move on. We say, let's move on. Okay, it was wrong, it's absolutely wrong and, and, and I confess and I apologize and, and sorry and so on and so on. Is this enough? How many times sorry? Million times sorry. Uh, and, and, and can we just let it go and move on because there is something amazing that God has prepared for us and we're going to miss that because we parked here. And it can become as a, for a church also, I know that with our church also, there is a constant you know, attack so that the orientation in the church would become something else instead of the word of God and, and this amazing understanding that God is supernaturally present here, it could become very horizontal and, and we would be like, you know, I mean, I totally believe in healing and, and people need to be healed and it happens and so on, but, but that could not be the main emphasis in the church. I, I wouldn't want to be in a church like that where all the time it's about healing. I think God's word is bigger than that. It, it has to be like, you know, the whole counsel of God, whatever that means. But, but like, you know, uh, in, on the spirit, uh, spiritual orientation, I think is a good word for that. Good. Okay. Uh, any question or comment? I mean, not comment, but a question by anybody? Let me see. Uh, to go back to the hearing, we, when did you start to hear from the Lord, you know? And then how often? I think maybe for me, there are only a few times where it was like, like suddenly, like, like God said something to me. Like it was like clear, very clear to me. I have a few of those in my life. Then I have like, like many, many times when I didn't know for sure if it was God speaking, but I acted on it, and I believed, and it was uh, profitable. And then I'm a pastor, so I go to prayer to hear from God for messages. And so I have a lot of that in my life where I really feel God is speaking from the word, you know, through, through me but not necessarily like giving me personal direction in that way in the category one. So then, uh, then also listening to others speaking like, like tonight and also my sisters and brothers in life, maybe on the phone or, um, you know, I get wisdom, a good counsel from somebody or a word of encouragement, you know. So there's like a couple of, Levels. Um, would you like to say anything about that, Pastor? Yeah, I think that um, also, like I mentioned, that that God created everything was created with love, the same way like God speaks with love, <laughs> like in the church, like God loves the congregation, the body of Christ through the messages. Like, um, I think we as preachers and pastors, we need to discern that, that, that God, through this message, God empowers people and, and loves them and, 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 and comforts them. And, and it's like, you know, um, 
the that's the bottom line like that's the atmosphere or whatever you would call it like the main emphasis is not again that that it's for the correction only or information only like uh, you know i sometimes sound like i'm anti academic i'm not anti academic i i respect those ones who have been called into the world of academy academia how do you say Acad academy whatever it is that they are called to so <clears throat> i don't uh, i i respect people who have that call for example in theology that they really have that mindset and 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 i want to be blessed by them i want to hear from them because they have done the hard work that i have not done and i could really like you know receive the blessing from them but but if if the atmosphere in the church is high theological then it uh, you know then it's just like you know becomes very selective there it's a certain kind of people that come to the church other people they don't connect with it and i think that this uh, i remember pastor Sarah, you said once that 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 doesn't matter if i'm speaking well if i don't communicate like if i'm not connecting with people i can be a good speaker i can have it really like you know my message uh, homiletically like well divided and i have the beginning the you know the main body of the message the conclusion everything goes well but there's nothing there like you know it, with a lot of numbers a lot of words but there's no nourishment and and i don't know this 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 um, theme of anointing is very interesting like um, I think it would be interesting to hear from you, like your understanding. What is anointing actually, and and is it like the mood of God, or is it a certain kind of a mechanism that you know works in the process of preaching and teaching, or or what actually is, is it? The, would you comment on that, just Yeah. yeah. Um. Maybe, maybe what I'm hearing from Pastor Mati is in a context, so I want to kind of make that context for you because it might help you. And I'm not sure exactly, but in Europe, in Europe, like preaching is not like the way we understand it in America or Latin America. When we had Latin American preachers here at our convention, we had one day for Latinos, you know. Wow, those guys are good. Those are good communicators. I enjoyed it. By the way, when was the last time you were here? A couple of years ago or no? Yeah. No, I was here, but I don't remember anything beyond yesterday. <laughs> okay. He said... No, I was here, but I don't remember anything beyond yesterday. So, no, I don't. I don't mean it to like it's not. But because we had COVID, yeah, we had COVID, and I just know that there have been people who. But anyway, um, I want to go back to the point, which was. I think the churches in Europe would be would be deeply blessed, if the leaders felt the liberty to minister in a way that God would give them the liberty and the freedom to minister in the spirit. And I do, they do. I mean, we have Pastor Texie, Tony Cooper. We have Pastor Riso. We have the Polish, Hungarian pastors. But I'm talking at generally, listen, this is how it goes. The culture in Europe is like, like intellectually sophisticated a little bit more than us maybe, and a little bit more like academic. And I mean, these people are serious about academia. And uh, if you take Finland as an example, like 
They say the most lawyers per capita in the world live in where? The United States, lawyers. Most psychologists per capita live where? Switzerland. The most engineers per capita live where? Finland. There are more engineers. Now, these people are very educated and they're very serious about learning and they want to be correct. Okay, but I say, like in, in the ministry, and I want them to hear me and understand me, I am not a, a theologian who is a professor. I am a street pastor. I'm a pastor on the street. I go to the street. I talk to people on the street. I want to communicate to people where they're living. I want to hear from them. I want to know what they're doing. I want to love them, and I want to be in their lives. I want to communicate to them. It's Ezekiel said, I sat where they sat. That's an old message from years ago from Pastor Stevens, who I'm sure heard from, you know, in the evangelical circles, these kind of messages. I sat where they sat. So I go to Dundalk, I sit in a cafe, and I see how people live. I want to know them. I want to be able to talk to them. All right, so if they are an engineer, I would like to talk like an engineer. But I'm not really educated that way. And I'm not so interested in it because I would rather be obeying what the Bible is. They can be both. You can be an academ academic and be obedient, but you can also be obedient to simply what the Bible is saying and have the power from God and have a message that touches the lives of people and to say, stop it. If stop it, I'm telling you, stop it. Stop that. Don't do that anymore. The house is on fire. Get out of the house. You hear me, get out of the house. See, that kind of words, that's, that's serious, you know. Like you say to a little boy, get out of the street. Get out of the street. It's not an academic issue. It's an issue of practical living and exhortation. So I would say to the European pastors, like, do you exhort, do you rebuke, do you reprove? That's Titus chapter 2. No, I am teaching, like, the Bible correctly. It's like, very good, please do that. But also, like, could you, could you also have emotion? Uh, could you also yell? Could you make it clear that you are serious about it? Could you tell a story that touches the hearts of people? Do you ever cry? Do you ever weep? Uh, do you ever hold somebody's hand? Do you have any compassion? Do you have emotion? Do you know that Jesus was a man of sorrows? You know, of course he was, because look at the terrible world that we live in. And he's like a man of sorrows. And the most common emotional word that identifies Jesus is that he was moved with compassion. So here we have, and I'm not saying greater grace alone, but I'm just saying all pastors in Europe, and I, it, it applies to all pastors everywhere, uh, but, and here in the United States, I mean, we have plenty of all kinds, but uh, just to say that um, where does the anointing come from? And I'm like a child, and I mean, I'm not saying it in false humility. I'm just saying, not in any humility, I'm just saying that I don't even know how, how this works, but I know when the Lord is with us and for some reason in our church, he is blessing us and we feel connection from the spirit in the congregation and in the pulpit. And we feel a connection. And I feel like what Pastor Monty said tonight was, this is easy because our ears are open, our hearts are open. We are not afraid. We are hungry, we are listening. So that helps him bring the message. 
But if the, if the church is cold, if it's legalistic, if it's judgmental, if it's depressed, these are all big words. My church is a depressed church. My church is a cold church. My church could care less. My church goes through the motions. So as a pastor, what are you gonna do with that group? You know, what am I gonna do with the dead church? Well, how am I gonna get it to live? Maybe we have to do some prayer and fasting. Maybe we have to have some quiet little meetings. Maybe we have to seek God to get, maybe I have to be very honest with them and tell them I'm very disappointed with our church. I'm very disappointed with what is happening here. We have to get serious. We have to obey God. We have to seek God. I don't want to be a pastor of this kind of church. It will kill me. I have about this much life left in me. And when I'm done with you people, I won't have any. <laughs> Guys, you're just a cold, nasty group of Christians. And that can't happen. You know, what if you could talk like that to your church? You know, God gave you the liberty. It's easy for me right now because you, we're one. But it, it's, a, it's a problem. And churches die because there isn't any anointing of God in the church because there isn't any humility. And it could be the pastor doesn't have humility. It could be that the people don't or a large number of them don't. And by the way, when we had our, our split here about 20 years ago, there was pride in people. There was pride in people. And we had problems because of pride. And that's not fun. And um, they said terrible things. They attacked people. They broke relationships. And nobody, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying like, I, it doesn't bother me. I like to talk objectively about the reality of it, not just for what happened here, but from stepping back, zooming out, and saying this can happen anywhere. It can happen to us again. And by the way, regarding the future pastor here in Baltimore, it'd be great to put it on our prayer list. Lord, whoever the next pastor is, let's pray for him. Let's pray that God would give us the right person. Whoever that is and whenever that happens, that's a God thing. But because this is a spiritual church, that can go on many times. You know how many times D.L. Moody's churches had shifted? Pastors, I believe it's seven pastors. And Irwin Lutzer was just the last one. I think they have a new one. But for 150 years of pastoral oversight that has been spiritual, to have a spiritual church is a great testimony of God, you know. So we want that to happen for us in greater grace. Okay, so um, did, did, I really went long on that one. What did you think about it? Was it good? Did you want to say anything about it? Yeah, I mean, the, the anointing of God. And, and shouldn't it be that every congregation is anointed of God. You can answer back to me. What do you think? Isn't it, isn't it supposed to be? And it is, is it only the pastor that is like making this happen? Or is it the congregation and the pastor? Pastor has a personal life with God, but it's the congregation. How about you are in a Cradle of Grace church in Europe or Asia or anywhere and and you feel that the messages are not anointed? Right. What what do you do? I mean, who are you? You're a member in the church or are you a pastor? You okay. Okay, I'm a member of the church. I could say I might be right, I might not be. I got to give it time. I'm not going to be jumping on it. I think in the ministry we could all have a, a dry time, like so-called, you know. But if it's, you know, going on for a, a time, I might just recognize it and just pray uh, for that to change. Um, so I got to be careful how I talk about it. Um, it. It can 
cause division. Um, it can be, um, you know, I just, we teach that um, we have to be careful, excuse me, with how we respect the pastor, the pastor's position, like his office. You have two things, you have the office and you have the man himself, but you have the office. So we have high regard for the office. So it can be that um, somebody in the church is, is not satisfied, but he doesn't talk about it. Um, he is praying, kind of carrying it with him. And if the pastor has an overseer, you know, which, which all of us should have, uh, elders and overseer, then I would, with, with prayer, and maybe a lot of patience, wait a long period of time, pray, uh, also, I should be careful that I am obeying God. I have a life of obedience, you know. I am on the street evangelizing, or I am in a prayer meeting, or I am available to God to obey God. I think that's a very good point, too, you know. Because it might be, if everybody in the church was obeying, or like humble and obeying instead of being critical, they're not critical. They may or be of discerning or observing, but it could be that if we obeyed, we would have an anointing on our life that would help the pastor in his ministry. That might happen, you know. Imagine if you have a congregation that's just humble and obeying God, and, and then the pastor is surprised. Wow, this meeting was really anointed. Like, how did that happen? Well, the congregation is obeying God. Very good point. You want to say something? No, I just wanted to say that that's a good point because that's a good way to look at it. Because, uh, okay, I might, maybe I'm not a pastor and I know nothing about it. And I, I feel that the messages are not anointed. Then I become critical and I, like, you know, talk to some direction and because I feel that I need to talk to someone but it can be dangerous because it can send like a wrong message and and then the pastor could say this is the microphone go ahead you do the pastoring like you know if you seem to be <laughs> knowing how to do it and you seems to know how to be a good pastor and what the pastor is supposed to do and how he's supposed come and take the microphone because I mean, what I'm saying is that 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 maybe you are not in a position because you don't know what it means to be in that place. But but I like that. I mean, that's like a beautiful idea: is that that people would, in humility, pray and together pray, and and they would minister to that pastor instead of like you know criticizing him or being not happy with him or trying to get rid of him. <laughs> yeah, instead of that, like, you know, really praying that how could we help him? Yeah, love him and, and, and encourage him. And things can change, that's so beautiful. God can change a stony heart. I mean, God can take a heart of stone and change it, yeah, so. Yeah, I, w I would say just to build up you guys, you, you've been on the road for decades and you, you bless this pulpit is really the result of a lot of obedience in this congregation, you know. A lot of experience, a lot of wisdom, a lot of obedience, a lot of faith, a lot of humility. I mean, this is, I think Pastor Shabelli, and, and he and Pastor Ronaldo, they are praying today. And I mean, this is amazing when, when pastors are, 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 you know, humble and obeying and ministering and, and we are a team, you know, we are a team then. But but then all uh, you know the from a teenager look at the the singer the girl Ohana who's from a Kenyan family singing tonight like an angel that was so beautiful and this young girl is a 
serious believer, you know. So, so we have what we have, and I always say, I, I say to God, Lord, you used Dr. Stevens to teach us so much, and you used him, and the people that are in this church are from him. I mean, a good number of them from those years. I mean, you know, and, uh, and here I am, and it's just an honor to be in a place where people learn to love, learn to forgive, and not be critical. Not be critical. This is a, this is a thing that, that a lot of people, there, believers, that they never learn that. They are much more critical than they are being a servant. They're not servants as much as they are critics. And I, I always said, have heard, I remember, they don't make statues for critics. They make statues for heroes. And heroes are not critics. Heroes are people who are just in a situation and if somebody has to do something and we have to serve or lose our life or we have to do something out of love and we have to be radical and we just have to, you know, look how we can make something good happen here. So, yes. So Pastor Valley is talking about Springfield, right? So he was in Springfield. There was a, a real, real collapse in a big church. It was 700 people, 50 people on the mission field. A lot of it was was Pastor Stratus, but it it all it unraveled. But Pastor Chabelli continued to minister to people that he knew and people trusted him, like Kathy Ryan and number of people, like 100 people, moved down here to Baltimore. So, um, um, yeah, these things happen. It's unfortunate that we would have these painful things happen in the, in the you know, church history. But they do happen, and, um, and um, people can discern and follow what the Spirit is saying and how he's leading and directing. Yeah. Okay, so let's end on a good note. What would that be? <laughs> let's see. We would say, um, um, we hear from the Lord. We, we went over that. It's not always easy. The, the anointing of God... It's a very real thing. We didn't hear it in the Kentucky testimony tonight, but basically they're saying that that revival is, is simply, and Don Barnes called me tonight, or today, and said he went to it, and he said it was amazing. And he said the unity and the love, he said, I don't even know, there was nobody in charge that was like the way he looked at it. And he met people from Texas who, he, they said, we drove there from Texas just because God told me. God said, go. And, and my, my friend, God had told him too. So we came, got jumped in the car and came. But people, they, it, it, it's anointed. It's the anointing, the presence of God, a visitation and uh, so the, it raises, thank you, Lord, for doing that, but I'm also glad that you've ordained for all of us to live in those times and also times where that anointing is not that strong. But I simply have to obey 
Like when Jesus went to the cross, could you say that Jerusalem was covered and filled with the Holy Spirit? We would say no. It was called the hour of darkness. And Gethsemane was not a fun time, right? And he's praying great drops of blood. That's also Christianity. So the church life has to learn it all. And sometimes the visitation is so strong that you could be speechless if singing and worshiping and have very little to say other than just praise the Lord, we are being visited by God and the angels are flooding this place. And it's so strong that people are driving in. Didn't he say 50,000 people have been coming in? And uh, it's, they are walking into the presence of God. Isn't that amazing? And they are like recognizing it. So uh, in our church, this is our visitation right now. We had this visitation and we're thankful, thankful for it. And we take this home with us and we live in it. And, and then another thing I want to also say sometime, I want to say something about going to work. Going to work like every day, going to work. And here, here's, the, here's the key thought on it. I heard it from Timothy Keller. It was like very interesting. He said, most people just go to work and they don't go to church. And many people are not Christians. Nine out of 10 people, let's say they're not Christians. So they say to us, what good is your religion if it is not going to help me at my work? Because my life is working. So you're religious and you go to church, very good for you, but I don't care about that. Does your religion work at the hospital, at the police station, and work at school, at the university? Does your religion help me in my life? Because I'm at work. Most of my life is at work. Isn't that a good question? And when we say there's a revival, like we want people to understand that's part of life for us. But we have to go to work on Monday. And what do we carry with us? A proverb, a psalm, a word, a prayer. And we work. And we love. And we love gay people. And we love people that are different from us. And Muslim people. And people that are lost. And alcoholics and drug addicts. And we love the Good Samaritan story is about a Jew who is beaten up and a Samaritan of a different race and a different religion stops and spends money and helps that Jewish man live. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is loving your neighbor. This is what it is. So th what I'm saying is the anointing of God means not only could I be in a revival like in Kentucky, but I will also come home. And I will go to work and I will carry that. And when I see uh, somebody who's of a different religion from me and a different lifestyle and somebody very different from me, can I love them? For God so loved a sinful world that he gave his only begotten son. This is like church life for us. And that's what, you know, that's what we are learning. And that's why we're here. Yeah. And then one last thing maybe is Jesus said some very interesting and I don't I didn't say it on purpose through the last week because I don't want to, to mislead people, but he said an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. You know that verse in Matthew twelve. There are people that look for signs. And he said an evil and adulterous generation is looking for a sign. And we are people that don't need signs because of the message tonight. We have words. We don't need signs. We need a quiet word. That's enough for us. Love your enemy. How about the word forgive? 
How about move on? Isn't that good? So with that, we'll close. Adios. Lord Jesus, bless as we go home tonight. Thank you for this week you gave us. Bless tomorrow night, tomorrow in the day, Pastor Mati's ministry, what we've heard tonight, what you're doing with us. In Jesus' name, amen. time, huh? Did you like that message you gave? This guy, wait a minute, let me tell Pastor Monty. Listen to this, Pastor Monty. Yes, I'm listening. Very interesting. We had COVID. Yes. And he had it. He almost died. He was in the hospital 55 days. And the doctor said they gave more oxygen to him than everybody in the state of Maryland. <laughs> I was at his bedside. I was sure he was going to die. He's like, for day and night, he's like this. <gasps> day and night, for 55 days. Okay, he's one. The second one is uh, John Nielsen. He almost died. Mm -hmm. But both of them, there he is. <laughs> Both of them lived. Absolutely. They lived. Yeah. I know you. Oh, wait a minute. I know you. Yeah. I know. I'm trying to remember that. Hey, thank you. Yeah.